the Irish, the people, depended on the potato. That's, that's basically what they had, potato and cabbage. Most of the, the, uh, the, the food, like um, uh, the meat and things like this, was shipped off to Britain. Yeah. Or, you and know, green. went, went, to, the, to, the, Lord. went Lord of the Lord of the Manor or something like that. This is famine country, okay? Baltimore, even now, is one of the, you know, is, it has fish galore. Yeah. You have to understand that they were fishing that place and bringing it down to Cork also to be sent, okay. you know, so that people died when there was fish in the sea yeah. right mm -hmm. by. You mm -hmm. know, so. The thing that struck me the most when yeah. we were over there, I said, but what about the fish? Yeah. What happened to the fish? Yeah. All the food is there under your nose. And yeah. of course, that's what it was, is they were not being allowed to eat the fish source that they had an abundance of. I mean, I grew up as a, a fishing family. So if when, in times of uh, our own uh, famine, like our own times when we didn't have a lot of food, mm -hmm. we had fish for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, it's sustained. So I didn't understand that. You know, fish and potatoes was healthy. But now we know it's because they were shipped off somewhere else. But are you saying that the ordinary person was forbidden to, to fish? Or, they, or just that they lived too far away from the water? No, no, not far away from the water. The, but the, the water is being fished by, by you know, uh, to, to, to actually be sent, you know, uh, eventually they put a railroad in uh, in the 20th century, but it would go down to, to Cork. It was not for right you. Food yeah. was not for you at all. Yeah. Any crops they grew would have to go to the rent. Right. See, they had to pay rent, so the yeah. potato was, that's why the potato was yeah. the staple, so when the potato yeah. rotted. Otherwise um, they'd be evicted if you don't exactly. pay your rent. And yeah. the problem but, uh, is simply they had only one or two varieties, so that it was a mon monoculture. Yes. So when it happened, there was no way to, yeah. to get, get around. That was their staple crop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say, when I, when I was here in 1950, 51, um, we still did, we ate meat once a week. You have mm -hmm. eggs, okay? There was, there was chickens around, but we should have what they call rashers. That, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a bacon. But basically, for the most part, we ate potatoes, and cabbage, uh, and some vegetable or something like that, because still, even at that time, meat was expensive, it was also being sent to England also. So the, the cattle production and things were, were done like that, you know. And it's, it, you know, it, 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 the history of this doesn't, it, it, it doesn't go back very far, really. Yeah, it doesn't. And, and how, how it, 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 it stayed even in the Irish Free State. And, and before that date, 1845 to 50, there were two other families, families. before right. that in that century, in the 20s. 1820s, that's right. And, 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 but people were, so here's the day, people, people were used to one or two potato failures. And, and so what happened, they, they waited. <coughs> and then it was after the second one, they, they, but they couldn't leave right away. It was 1845, 1846, 1847. That's when they got on the ships, 1847. One ship in January, February of 1847 went directly to the States and people were sick on it and dying. And so America said, nobody can come to the United States in the year 1847, 1848. So everybody had to go to Canada. And they, they weren't prepared. And the man who received them at the, at the uh, quarantine place on Grosil, a year and a half later, he committed suicide. He was the head doctor. They blamed him, but he had warned them for a year. Hmm. It's just so much to be said around. Do you know where the food was shipped to in Britain? Well, probably Liverpool. Not, uh, uh, Liverpool or Southampton. What I find so fascinating about potato, potato originates in the Americas. Oh, yeah. what do you think Peru. About Peru? Uh, uh, they, they had yeah. 25, 35 yeah. varieties. Yeah. Uh, in and fact, it's, it's the staple yeah. crop all over the world, and it yeah. came from, yeah. fr from the you know, mm -hmm. the New World. Yeah. But Ed, what I read said that there was a certain point at which the okay, British no way, refused to allow new seed potatoes from Peru to be brought in to Ireland. I don't doubt that. 
There's a whole bunch. If you read it, I, I didn't see that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Even in terms of good people wanting to send food, yeah, uh, or to give grain, you know, yeah. compassionately at a, a, a small price or pre, the Trevelyan see, and the British government refused right. that because it's interfering with market the, the, prices. The laissez faire theory. Right. Laissez faire, yeah. yeah they are. From what I have read, there were powerful forces that prevented the setup of food and soup kitchens for a long, long time for that reason that it that it was. Uh, not not going to support the market. The I, I believe I read that. What happened here with the famine and then the great removal of people to the Americas resulted in the ongoing genocide of the peoples of the Americas and that that's still continuing and that there's a direct, absolutely direct and overt connection between what the British did here to the Irish mm -hmm. and what was done under colonization in the Americas and mm -hmm. is continuing to this day. If we don't acknowledge yeah. those connections, then we're complicit in these deaths here as well as the ongoing deaths that are happening on Turtle Island. The wounded at the level of community in one generation play out the patterns and play out the woundedness in the next generation. And so, you know, that's why the, the healing of each of us it's not a selfish act to heal yourself so that you can be healthy within your community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an important mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a, um, it's not a medical thing to heal trauma. It's a deep spiritual mm -hmm. thing to heal mm -hmm. trauma. Drugs don't heal trauma. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. able to talk about the, the, what has happened and being able to heal with other people who understand those wounds and being able to recognize what you yourself have done to try to soothe those wounds that doesn't work. You need that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you end up, you know, traumatized yourself. I mean, I think the, 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 the gun violence and the violent reaction is actually trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Men have been very mm -hmm. traumatized. Yeah. intergenerationally. Mm -hmm. Women have too, but men have a harder time acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. There's not much allowance in the masculine culture for, for the amount of woundedness. And certainly in a Western culture, there's not much uh, ways of linking together and healing together. And so what happens is that that trauma gets passed on mm -hmm. into violence. Mm -hmm. Even our young sons, they mm -hmm. say, you know, if, if anybody did that to my mother or my sister, I'd tell you what I would do to them. And it's very hard for them to see that that's not the way that it's going to be healed. And I think that historical trauma that you're talking about gets extended into the lives of our children through the games and through the media because that, that trauma reenactment that we see on these violent videos are helping our youth to desensitize and to numb their inner spirit so that they can I, you know, it's 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 a survival mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. yeah, violence is entertainment. It, it's it's just amazing what's happening to the spirit as a result. So. Yeah. And what is going on right now in Zimbabwe, which we call um, a situation of human rights violation, a situation of democracy, it is actually stealing people's land because in Zimbabwe today you have uh, point. Uh, 0.03 percent. Did you hear that? 0.03 percent mm -hmm. of a tribe called the English mm -hmm. owning mm -hmm. over 70 percent of the land. And that is uh, only possible 
as an act of war on the people who depend on land. And so, you know, um, it is really so cynical, such a cynical war going on in, in the country, which people really don't, don't understand, which now translates into democracy. And which, you know, uh, a war in which uh, those who are behind it now come forward to pause as the champions of the people. Um, in Namibia, I visited Namibia in 1989, and uh, um, there you find over 70% of the land owned by mostly absentee German landlords who fence off the land and come once a year to hunt. And, uh, you know, and the people have been pushed off the land. That's what happened here. Yeah, they've been pushed off the land and uh, in, uh, left in this uh, less than 30% of the land. Philippines. And in desert and the same desert places. And the only thing, life support system given to them is a tap of water. And you go there today, you find children with bloated eyes because they are malnourished. Maybe. That also is an act of war. What happened with the famine, you know, um, Paulo was just saying that when he learned it in school, it, it just felt like it just happened, but without it being induced from outside. Yeah. So we, we don't get all of those. It's always like that inaccurate picture. We don't get the full picture. Yeah. We only get the sanitized picture. So, you know, just say a little bit more of what you were saying. Yeah, that, uh, you know, when we were taught about. Uh, uh, the Irish famine in uh, at high school, it's as if the famine came from heaven. But mm -hmm. actually, this you know this famine was made in England, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and imposed on people here by mm -hmm. taking away their land. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was you know coming here, it becomes clear that until we understand what the English did to the Irish and to the Scots we can never fully understand what they did to the First Nations peoples of, of North America or what, the or, or, or what they are, do, or what they yeah. are doing in Zimbabwe right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, and, uh, and also this is a challenge to the Irish and to the Scots. They have to tell us what happened to them because mm -hmm. they also, you know, uh, you know don't, mm -hmm. uh, don't tell us you know, what uh, happened to them. So yeah. I think we, this is uh, the new stage of, uh, yeah. of, uh, of new knowledge and uh, you know, to be the basis of new understanding and new relationships.